Ten years ago today, the anime adaptation of Kaiichi Arawi's Nichijou began airing on Japanese televisions. It's my favorite anime and manga series, and for such a silly little anime, the impact that it had on me cannot be overstated. Naturally, I wanted to commemorate this anniversary with a video regarding my thoughts on the show, but I know myself. If I took the time out to write down everything I thought about Nichijou, the resulting content would be nothing but five hours of me gushing over the metaphorical intricacies of scenes like this. Kuogoto. And more importantly, it would never get finished. So in order to make sure this video gets released in time for the introductory paragraph to be relevant, I will restrain myself and simply try to answer this simple question. What is Nichijou about? In a literal sense, Nichijou is a slice-of-life comedy about three high school first-year students. Ayo Yuko, goofball and resident moron, Mio Naganohara, yaoi artist and sometimes demigod, and Mai Minamaki, trickster and enigmatic individual. It also follows the everyday events of the Shinonome Laboratory, home of the eight-year-old professor named Hakase, her robot caretaker Nano, and a cat given the ability to speak named Sakamoto. The story also focuses on a number of other side characters, most of them students or faculty at the school where the main cast attend. Nichijo is not labeled as a parody, and I would also be hesitant to call it that myself, but there are aspects and jokes in the show that are presented in such a way that makes it difficult for me to not relate them to tropes I've seen in other anime or manga. A huge part of Nichijou's comedy is taking fairly mundane and regular events and blowing the stakes and reactions to them completely out of proportion. Like, you know how sometimes in anime someone will have something bad happen to them and they'll flinch backwards like, Ugh, and then go into this deep inner monologue that's like, Shimata! I left the oven on at home. This will no doubt slightly increase my electricity bill at the end of the month and adversely affect my search for the Dragon Balls, or something like that. No one really acts that dramatically. Nijijo takes this idea and runs a marathon with it, having every character react to minor inconveniences as if they were the end of the world, and treating everyday domestic trifles with the same grandeur and spectacle of an epic final battle. There's a beautiful irony in seeing explosions and flames come from characters when the actual events that elicit this raw power is, bro, you messed up my order at Japanese Olive Garden. There's also the character of Tachibana Misato, who is so sundere for the school's resident gentleman Sasahara that she unloads her frustration in the form of high-powered ballistics. Or the scene where Mai confesses her love to Yuko on the riverbank, and just as it begins to get awkward, Mai sucker punches her and the audience by just being like, Haha, nah, JK. Unless... Nah, never mind. It's like the show knows about the Yuri undertones of Slice of Life manga, baits it out into the open, and then shoots it out of the sky. Akase in any other anime would be this precocious and adorable genius who uses the innocence of childhood to become wiser beyond her years, but in Nichijo, she's just any other eight-year-old, really bratty and dumb. How about this bit where the show spends what must be a tremendous amount of money to animate a 3D panning shot and license the official FIFA theme just so Mai can flick a coin? I could go on about things I think could be parody, but it's hard to tell with this show. Part of its charm is that sometimes it seems like it truly has something to say, but other times it just wants to make a really confusing joke. But I've been beating around the bush, yeah? Like, what is Nichijou actually about? Nothing, really. And not in that Seinfeld way where it's like, it's a show about nothing, but it's just a manner of saying that the stories that each episode centers around are benign occurrences. Nichijou is very much a series of comedic and cute vignettes, only loosely strung together by characters, location, and sometimes time when the show feels like making a running gag. Sometimes these restrictions are still too much though, and the show frequently breaks into sequences like Short Thoughts, Like Love, or Helvetica Standard, completely separate from the main portion of the show, all for the purpose of freeform gags, small acts of kindness, or just to tell you what it's thinking about that day. This is probably one of Nichijou's greatest strengths, or weaknesses, depending on your perspective. The anime kinda just does whatever it feels like, which leads to a great variety of jokes, characters, and amazingly silly ideas come to life. It's like the show wants to do something cute, so it cuts to Hakase and Nano doing something cute. Then it's like, I want to see someone shoot lasers out of their mouth, so it cuts to that. Then it decides and wants to show you something cool, so it does. Then it looks at a Hirana Mishpash painting while busting into the acid supply and cuts to Helvetica Standard. I can definitely see how this can be a pretty big turnoff though. Part of it is the nature of the slice of life genre, but the fact that Nichijou is completely unconcerned with creating a narrative, and knowing anything can happen can really lower the stakes to ground level, and remove any form of investment in the show. The anime is scatterbrained enough as is, and when things keep changing every other scene, what's the point in being interested in the anime if the anime isn't interested in itself? Further, you could extend that argument and say the show has an identity crisis, where it can't really decide what it wants to be. 
a comedy, a moe babysitting show, a romantic drama, a surrealistic fantasy? These are valid points that I'm not sure I have a real rebuttal to. All I can really say is that Nichijo is... Nichijo. The appeal for me comes from the wonderful characters and the atmosphere of the anime itself. The show absolutely bleeds personality, from the little touches in the animation to the unique transitionary slides, to the little moments when the show decides that it wants to be wholesome for a few minutes, to the way that it is surprisingly relatable. Nichijo did the I have no idea what I'm trying to get at the coffee shop bit like five years before it became a tired gag. All this really makes the show feel alive, and like it has its own little voice and identity that it speaks to the viewer through. Nichijo has a truly engrossing personality that suits it well, as coming of age and growing into who you are is one of the big themes in the anime. I suppose it shouldn't be too surprising that a show about high school students ends up becoming about self-discovery and finding out who you are. I really like the way that Nichijo approaches this time-worn idea, though. Instead of having characters sort of outgrow old immaturities and habits, it's more like they abandon the anxieties that societal expectations place on them for having particular interests or quirks, and are allowed to really become themselves as a result. Like I said, the show doesn't really have a plot, but some events are connected, so characters end up going through these nice mini-arcs throughout the run. Initially, Mio is so embarrassed of her yaoi drawings that she goes to incredible lengths to keep them hidden. But after showing it to her friends by accident, receiving praise from Miss Sakurai, and getting second place in a contest, she has the confidence to not only show her manga to the gang, but have them help work on it as well, to the kind of results you'd expect. Yuko has a scene where she decides that she and Mai aren't acting like proper young women, so she tries to keep herself from pointing out Mai's oddball behavior and turning their relationship into a comedy routine. Neither one can contain themselves though, and Yuko breaks under the pressure, resigning herself to the fact that she and Mai will never be typical high school girls, but happy that she has something that makes her feel good. Even Nakanojo, a side character who wants to be a scientist and belongs to a family who can only grow hair in the shape of a mohawk, gets his own moment of development. Nakanojo's father wants him to continue on with the family Daifuku business, so much so that he forcibly sticks the company's mascot to his head with wet paint. In an act of pure strength and defiance, the otherwise clumsy and peaceful Nakanojo tears off the Daifuku and in the process, his hair, as if to symbolically reject both the business and his heritage in pursuit of his dreams. In terms of self-discovery, however, Nano undoubtedly has the most character growth, a great irony considering she is likely the most adult one in the main cast. Nano's goal is just to lead an ordinary life, but she's put into a constant state of panic that people will recognize her as a robot, either from the various functions that activate at random, or from the glaringly large wind-up screw on her back. It doesn't help that Hakase is an irrational child, who refuses to remove the screw for even the outward appearance of normalcy. The second half of the series begins when Hakase comes to realize that Nano has been a good caretaker despite all the shenanigans she has been put through, and lets Nano attend high school, which Nano sees as the first step to becoming a normal girl. Why does a robot need to go to school? <laughs> Dude, just work with me here, alright? When Nano gets to school, it becomes apparent that just because she's more integrated into society doesn't mean she's really any closer to seeming normal. The other half of the main cast pretty much immediately try to trick her into revealing if she's a robot, and through one way or another find out. But the girl's reactions to learning that Nano is a robot is much more accepting than you perhaps imagine. Yuko thinks it's cool, Mio doesn't bring it up because she acknowledges that it hurts Nano's feelings, and Mai is in no position to judge anyone for being weird. The three girls are therefore actually able to develop a friendship despite Nano's curious state of being. Of particular interest is this scene where Yuko accidentally pulls off Nano's arm and instead of gawking at it, asks if she's hurt. In the final episode, Hakase offers Nano a tiny screw that will be much less visible than the one on her back. It is here that Hakase reveals the technicals of the screw's design. As Nano goes to put away her screw, she comes to realize that despite her life not being so ordinary, she has friends and family who don't think she's odd and like her for the person she's always been. The screw is a representation of who Nano is, and to remove it would be to remove part of herself for the sake of convenience or societal acceptability, when there are already people who accept her for just the way that she is. It's like the anime is saying, 
Hey kid, you're a bit screwy, but that's okay. It's part of your charm, and it's what makes you... you. Of course, the little screw ends up being a joke, so it doesn't really matter, but you get the idea. So that's what Nietzsche Joe is about. Satire, sentiment, and self-realization. Well, yes, but I think I'm still giving you the runaround. I guess if this wasn't a rhetorical question I created for the script, and was a real question you were asking me regarding what the anime was about on a greater level, I'd say that Nietzsche Joe is both exactly and not at all what the title describes it as. With a title like Ordinary Life, you've no doubt gathered that the joke is that the life and times of the characters is not at all typical. It initially presents itself as a run-of-the-mill slice-of-life anime, but then goes out of its way to be as wild as can be to contradict that notion. As previously stated though, these bombastic displays of animation are all for really insignificant daily events, so in a way, it is highly unusual, but it is not. It's extraordinary, but it's also extraordinary. Even though Nano's revelation is the end of the series, I'd actually say the climax is in the penultimate episode and follows a scene with Mio. Mio sees her crush and muse Sasahara in the arms of Tachibana, and in anguish, runs throughout town in a great chase. When she finally stops, she saved a child from drowning, earned the respect of a boxing master, and somehow received a pardon for assaulting a police officer. The events of her life change so rapidly and so unexpectedly that she sort of fails to be upset about Sasahara anymore and simply begins to laugh. There's so much beauty, fun, and surprises in life that one shouldn't get caught up in a tragedy, even if it seems big at the time, because in the greater scheme, there's so much more to it that makes it all worth living. This is accentuated by Sasahara's statement in episode 4, which might as well be the thesis statement for the whole show. I think what Nietzsche Joe is really about is displaying the true value in our everyday, mundane lives. I think that many of us would like to escape to a place where our lives were not so burdened by jobs or school, where we could be exciting adventurers or heroes, but I also think that there's a lot in this world that we take for granted because we're so used to it. The little miracles, the daily interactions with friends and family, those weird things that happen that you make offhand comments about later, the good and bad events we encounter on the way to achieving our dreams. We don't really recognize them because they happen so often that they've become humdrum and kind of boring. So, Nietzsche Joe cranks the action and weirdness up to 11 to give you something you aren't used to, to remind you that even the most normal things can still be wild and funny, super cute, or breathtakingly magical. It's not ordinary life, and yet, it is. It's the celebration of the wonder of living, even when it's hidden in plain sight, that makes Nietzsche Joe my favorite anime. The show is not without faults. As I said, the plot is basically non-existent and you'll probably hate it if you're not super into cute things because it really likes to take time to show you that stuff. Further, there are a fair amount of jokes that are pretty rooted in Japanese culture and without context will be lost on the viewer. It's also a slice of life anime and I will fully admit to overthinking this show to a vast degree, so you may not find the depth of meaning that I did when I watched it. Still, I urge you to check it out in any way you can, though I suppose legally would be preferred. This show didn't exactly make its money back. It's a show incredibly close to my heart, and there's no way words could do justice to the impact it had on me. It's crazy, it's calm, it's funny, it's serious, it's violent, it's peaceful, it's relatable, it's incomprehensible, it's romantic, it's platonic, it's real, it's surreal, it's flat and static, it's flowing and moving, it's ugly, it's beautiful, it's everyday life, it's Nietzsche.